I'm going to open with a word of prayer. Uh, today's a great day. Uh, there's lots of different things going on in Canada. Uh, lots of, just lots of stuff going on. But today we are looking at what's going on in heaven. So, and in the future. So this is going to be a great, not really a distraction, because this is more important than what we're seeing on the earth. That's more the distraction. So Lord, we hand to you this time. We pray that you would reveal yourself to us as we look into the rep book of Revelation, we ask that you would just kind of draw back the curtain so we could see a better glimpse of you, so we know what we're supposed to do as we follow you and endure. Amen. Amen. So as we get going uh, with part three, this is the heavenly vision. Uh, this one might, I'm not sure uh, how short it's going to be, so be prepared for questions. Um, but as we begin, I just want to expand a little bit about the idea of the author and the writers of scripture. And because a lot of people are like, well, you know, the Bible's written by men, right? But it's also written by God because God worked through those men. And then it made me think, and, and Adelaide's mentioned this to me and other people have mentioned it to me. Who is Jesus? Jesus is fully God and fully man. Jesus is also the word of God. The word of God is the written word that is a partnership of God and men. So it all works together that way. So I was just like, wow, that's, that's so exciting. So it's, it's, it's the word of God. It's Jesus Christ. Um, God and man. Perfect. Now, Jesus in person is perfect. 100% God, 100% man. So really exciting. Uh, and as we're getting ready for the scriptures tonight, we're going to be trying to pay attention because, you know, there's, there's all the authors in the Bible, the individual authors, but God's really the big author. He's behind it all. And as we get ready tonight, we're going to look at some specifics. Remember, this is a how to read the Bible. So we're looking at the author. We're looking at the intended audience. We're thinking things through differently. And today it's what is the action that's taking place? The Bible is a book of action. And you always need to pay attention to action. Now, when I'm working in French, I do that all the time because I have to be thinking about the verb and how do I conjugate the verb? Because uh, that's what I got uh, a lot in school. It's not as challenging now that I've got French tutors that help me all the time. But what action is taking place? So it's important when we're reading the Bible to take a look at what action is going on. Uh, especially in this next passage that we're reading, it's important. You even get distracted really easy in this one, trying to figure out all the weird images that are going on but it's more important to take a look at what is the action and who is doing the action. And sometimes English isn't as clear. So it, you might need to ask or look at a different uh, language even sometimes if, you, if you're familiar with one. Because there are some times where it's like, well, who is the you in this sentence? Because you know, I could ask that question. I said, you know, I want you, you, and you to go fix the car. Well. Who am I talking to? But that's the way that English is, and it's 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 just a little more clear sometimes. So we got to take our time, go ask ourselves who's taking part in what we're reading, this action taking place. And then a last part is what is the tense? What is the tense of those actions that are taking place? Is it in the future? Is it in the past? Is it present tense? We think of God's name when God was introduced to the people of Israel. What do they call him? Moses asks him, what's your name when people ask me about you? The answer is, I am. I am who I am. Because when God communicates with us, it's in present tense. And there are some times in the Bible where there's some different tenses used. I don't even know what they're called. But it's in the future for the prophet sometimes. But it's already past tense for God. Because he's like, this has already been taken. How does that work? Well, because God actually knows and he's taking care of it. He can do that. We can. The one I focus on the most, if it's something that's in present tense, I should be paying attention. Let's get into Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4 and 5 are together. We could make them all one chapter. We were the guy writing the chapter and verse. We're not. Um, so it's what we have. And John is going to set the scene up in the first four verses. He's going to kind of do it like he's, he's setting a scene. 
and you get to see the backdrop before the action takes place. And this is, this is a transition part as he's setting the scene. Because you're transitioning. Remember, we just last week talked about the seven churches. Well, now he's going to transition into something different. This says, after these things, that's the transition sentence. Look out for those when you're reading the Bible. There's a lot of them there. After these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here and I will show you the things that must take place um, after this. So right away, we could get ourselves into a lot of trouble. Because when I think, when I read this, and I was creating the notes for this, the day before I had watched a movie with Elsa, and it was science fiction, and the guy could literally open doors with magic. What's that? No, it was Doctor Strange, which actually I don't recommend, but I was watching Doctor Strange, and we were watching it together. And here's this guy, he's opening doors. So when I picture, I automatically start to picture science fiction. You know, it's like Star Trek, where all of a sudden the door opens. Or even the Chronicles of Narnia, there's a time where a door just magically appears. And people walk through it and they disappear. But we got to be careful. This is a warning for me going, okay, you're picturing what you know. Go back to the audience and think of what they know. So just be careful. I'm not applying what I see around me to that time period. So for me, it was like, okay, this is a warning. Don't get confused because there's a lot of images coming up. So we're, we're not going to do that. So here comes the rest of the setting. Immediately, I was in the spirit. and Behold, a throne set in heaven. One sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like Jasper, and Sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, an appearance like an emerald. And around the throne were 24 elders, or 24 thrones, and on the throne sat 24 elders clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And there's not any action yet. He's just describing what he sees. He sees the throne of God. God Almighty seated on the throne. This is God the Father seated on the throne. All he's really describing for us is the color that is there. Because that's all he can describe at this point. And, you know, you can start, start to look at, and I have a little gem book in my basement just in case, you know, we find some nice gems outside. And so I can find out what all the different colors are and what each property is of each one. But I think the point is John's like, this is beautiful. I really think the point is just simply, it's beautiful. Because a rainbow has beauty of all the colors. He's just trying to say God's throne is beautiful. So rather than getting caught up in trying to determine all the symbolism about that, just let's just say, you know, it's beautiful, the one sitting on the throne. And then it's like, well, what about the 24 elders? The 24 elders clothed in white with golden crowns. Who are the 24 elders? And again, we can get caught up in all kinds of things. Um, I asked my friend, Pastor Jake, and I said, do you think the people at that time knew who the 24 elders are? He's like, yeah, I think it's more symbolic than anything else because there was 12 tribes of Israel and 12 apostles. But it doesn't mean that it's actually the 12 actual guys, you know, where it was. Exactly, because John is one of them. So how is he going to see himself? So it's more symbolic of, of that. Because he actually gets to talk to one of the elders. Or did he talk to himself? That's very science fiction. You know, so that's where we can get caught up. The important thing is there are these 24 symbolic spots and they surround God. But we're really going to focus in on the action. Rather than speculation of who they are, what is the action these guys take instead? Because we can really get off with the... Um, trying to figure out who they are. So moving on, um, let's take a look at the action. Action is going to happen. It says, from the throne proceeded lightnings, that's action, thunderings, action, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning, that's an action. 
before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So this, that's the fullness of God is there. Seven meaning perfection. We've seen that number over and over again. We're going to keep seeing it. Seven means perfect. So the spirit of God is perfectly there. Before the throne, there is a sea like of glass, like crystal. So that's pretty calm. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. And the first living creature was like a lion. The second was like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Now the four living creatures each had six wings and they were full of eyes all around, outside and within. And they don't rest day or night. Okay, right now we could stop and go, what? As if you're trying to picture this and that is what you're doing, you can get really caught up. But again, I'm gonna say the emphasis on this one is not about the creatures. Because people do that. They end up worshiping the angels, the messengers of God. John here, even, even John, in some of the instances in this book, he tries to get down and worship some of the age guys. But they're going to say no. So what we're saying is it's the focus on the actions that these guys are going to take. Not worshiping the angels. Because if we were to see an actual angel, we would all be tempted to worship it. Because it's so much different than us. And so much more pure and holy. But these four living creatures belt out holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come all day long. This is what these guys say. And when these guys, these angels, they all have different representations on them of strength, of honor. Like that's what each one of these things are. You think of an eagle, you think of amazing strength. They are top of the chain when it comes to birds. Um, at the same time, a calf, maybe not tar top of the chain, but something beautiful about a calf. And whenever these living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, the 24 elders fall down before him who sit on the throne and worship him who lives forever and cast their crowns. And they respond by saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created so for me it's exciting to see the action that's happening here. the 24 elders what do they do to give praise to god they don't they're not sitting there going oh look at me i'm an elder look at me this is what i've done they are going you O oh god are worthy they give their crowns they give all their glory to god these other creatures, as fearsome as they are to behold, they cry, holy, 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 to the creator. They're worshiping at this point. Notice the words are, he was and is and is to come. And the elders are talking about God, the creator. So they're worshiping God in heaven as God, the creator. And that's exciting. And that's actually something we know there are people around here that, excuse me, they worship a creator. Here's a passage that says, hey, do you know the Bible talks about the creator? And this is what it says about him. We worship the creator, and there are these amazing people and angels that worship him, the creator. And so that's, that's exciting. I also noticed, how many times does it say holy? Three times. I like to think that's for each part of the Godhead. Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Spirit. Is it, is that perfect? I, I would say it's probably that way, but I wouldn't say it's 100%, but I know three shows up in just about everything. How many elements are there? Well, you have a liquid form of an element, element, element. No, a liquid form of an element. That would be a lot of liquid for an element. But no, in elements, there is liquid, gas, and solid. An egg has a shell, a white, and a yolk. God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We are spirit, soul, and body. So our spirit connects with God. That becomes alive when we get born again. Our soul is who we are as individuals. 
control my mind, my will, my memories, my dreams, my emotions, and then our bodies, our physical bodies. So the actions here is important. God, the creator, is being worshipped. And then that's chapter four already. Short, but it really sets a stage for how big God is. So we're going to move to chapter five already. And if you have any questions, you can always just, you know, put your hand up or shout out a question right away. Chapter five says, and I saw the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll written inside and on the back and sealed with seven seals. And I forgot my scroll that winter made for me today. Um, and it had a seal on it because winter has a seal of her own. So if she mails you a letter, it has her seal on it. Right. And so it has a W and a pattern with it and she will melt some wax and she will press the seal in so that if you have permission from winter, you can open that seal. But this one, it says it has seven seals. So when you break the first seal, the first scroll comes out. And when you break the second seal, the second scroll comes out, so to speak. It's like it's all kinds of scrolls bunched together. And then I saw a strong angel Okay, so I don't know what's the difference between a strong angel and an angel and those other angel creatures, but he sees a strong angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and loose the seals? And no one, no one in heaven or on earth was, or under the earth was able to open it or to look at it. So I wept much, this is John, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to look and loose the seven seals. Now, just a, something else. Remember we talked about whenever we're in Revelation and someone says, he who has ears to hear, Pay attention, okay? Here it's saying, there's another phrase that says, and I looked and beheld, or then I turned and I looked, or I turned and I saw. John hears things sometimes, and then he turns and sees something that's completely different from what he heard. So in this case, he heard, don't worry, the line of the tribe of Judah and the root of David has prevailed. When we think of a lion, we think, well, some people who watch too much Wizard of Oz think cowardly lion, but otherwise, Aslan, Aslan we think power, we think lion, yes. <sighs> That's right. Like, oh. Or we think of the root of David. You cannot get a more bold king in Israel's history than David. David challenged Goliath as a youth. David was Fearsome as a warrior. Fearless, exactly. And then he says, and I looked and I beheld and in the midst of the throne of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders, so at the very heart of where the throne is, stood a lamb as though it had been slain. What? He's a, you, you would be expecting what he heard about was a lion or a warrior, what he saw was the slain lamb. Not just any slain lamb, the slain lamb. And it says it has seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. It's like that would, again, be very freaky to see a lamb with seven eyes and seven horns. I'm not drawing that picture, because that's just weird. Exactly. Like, so if you get caught up in the imagery, it can be weird. But what does the number seven represent? Perfection. That's what this is about. The perfect land of God. Which we know is Jesus. I have to share with the people here because they can't hear when 
people oh, out, yeah. out in the audience are, are talking. So I just repeat what everyone says. But Frank was saying, have people like JK Rowling or ones that invent these weird creatures, did they read the Bible? Sometimes that's where the imagery is coming from. Believe it or not, there's, there's lots of imagery, biblical imagery that finds its way into literature. And it, it finds its way onto t-shirts, um, like the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You know, you see those kind of things like a Motley Crue t-shirt, right? Um, which is heavy metal. Amazingly enough, the biblical imagery is still strong. People just can't help it. So here is the lamb that was slain. So he looks and he saw it, and it's that second time something different and now lamb slain can actually go back to Cain and Abel because the first animal sacrifice was done by Abel the first righteous person that was born Adam and Eve weren't born the first righteous person born sacrificed an animal and here's one of those images of a lamb slain it's like I've heard that before and the ultimate picture of a lamb slain is when the people of Egypt, now the people that are reading this, this is one of the things they're thinking of. We think of Passover, because when the Israelites were leaving Egypt and the final plague came, if you did not have a slain lamb and the blood on your door and you were eating the lamb inside, you would have lost your firstborn. Didn't matter if it's firstborn dog, didn't matter if it's your firstborn in the household or your servant, they all would have died. Didn't matter if the firstborn was now 85 years old. If they were a firstborn, they died. So we we see that, that this is a image going back to them. Even in Noah's day, Noah had to keep extra pairs of animals of the animals that would be sacrificed. It's something that's always been there because we need a sacrifice. This is the perfect sacrifice. And so we just looked at it and go, okay. By the way, if you want to look at the story of Passover, it's Exodus 12 to review it. Um, we're not quite that time of year yet, but we're not far off from it. Uh, you no, know, Easter comes soon. So the lamb is not a powerful creature in itself. The strength of a lamb is its purity. It is pure. It's one of the most pure animals. Just its innocence. A, a lamb is just an innocent animal. And Jesus was the same. His purity was his real strength. Now, the chapter begins with this scroll, right? And the scroll is for the end. It has seven seals on it. And only one person has the right or authority. Open. Oh, Now, we just want to think about that. Scrolls are also an image. There's all kinds of scrolls in the Old Testament. In fact, every book of the Bible was technically a scroll. Because they didn't have books like we have. Yeah, so the Dead Sea Scrolls was copies of the Bible, books of the Bible. And you didn't take out individual, like you didn't have a big Bible where it was like all the scrolls together. You took out each scroll as you wanted. So if you wanted to read about Samuel, first or second Samuel, it was all on one long scroll that you'd have to put out on the table to read without chapter and verse. So you got to find your place and you go right to left because it's Hebrew. So it's just different. So we have that, that image of a scroll and this is the scroll that marks the sign at the end. Because that's what's going to happen. When Jesus opens these parts of the scroll Different, different events are going to happen towards the end. And it's going to be repeated at the same time because as these scrolls are being opened, seven trumpets blast. As these seven trumpets are being blasted, seven bowls are being poured out. And there's events that are happening on earth. So that's what I mean. There's a pattern here. They repeat themselves. Otherwise, the end times would be 28 years long. Yes, Deb? No. These seals have not been opened yet. This is something that's supposed to still happen. And we'll see that as he opens up each one of the seals. And it's 
as he takes, it's what's important to me. And most people here know my, my, my genuine heartfelt belief in the end times is the father knows even Jesus submitted to the father and said, you know what? The father knows I'm good with that. And so should we here. Who is holding the scroll? God, the father, when he says it's time, he hands it to Jesus. Nobody else knows when that is. We might have some idea when that is, but nobody else really knows when that is. The Father hands the scroll to Jesus when he decides. So I think that's really cool, really exciting. It takes a lot of pressure off me trying to figure it out. Uh, I don't have to spend money on that. Um, I don't have to try to do things to help advance that. Uh, if there's anything that I want to do to help advance that, Jesus also said that all the world needs to hear and see the gospel. So I want to support missionaries to go in places that no one has ever gone before. And I would love to see that. Besides the fact that it's it's just the right thing that they should be able to hear too. Right? It's impacted my life. I want other people to know. So the slain man of God. We're going to keep going here. It says... Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders, what are they going to do? They're going to fall down before the land. Each of them has a heart and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song together. You are worthy to take the scroll. Open its seals, for you were slain and you have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. That's amazing. So I kind of get the picture out of these 24 elders. He, they just said, these 24 elders, out of every people group. This is a pretty various group. They're, from, I mean, where we are, we'll just say they're not all white guys. I, I, what do you picture when you first see the 24 elders? Do you picture a bunch of old white guys that's not what it is it's all varied i think that's exciting it, you know there could be people of all different kinds of we just know they're clothed in white and i love how john actually says he's never heard this song before worthy are you to take the book and break its seals for you were slain and purchased for god with your blood from every tribe every tongue and every people a nation and nation you have made them a kingdom and priests to our god and they will reign upon the earth you know we're included in that these are exciting things we look at this and go wow what's the action that's happening they're praising god now i don't just want to take a, a description of this is what the kingdom of god is made up of so each one of those words tribe tongue people and ethnos now tribe the Greek word is phile, and that's like a people group descending from a few. So like, you know, the tribes of Israel, they can actually trace their ancestors back to a very few people. Now, I, I, I really can do some of that, but it all becomes speculation in my family. I can't go back to like the one ancestor. I am related to, there's a, there's a, a Steve family out east. And they have like 2,200 relatives, all coming descended from the same family. That would be a tribe based upon that. Um, the next word is tongue, which is glossa, which is language. So every language can be represented, right. which is really exciting because that redeems what happened at um, Babel. Because Babel is a bad thing, right? Babel, language becomes a judgment at Babel. God disperses the people. He confuses their language. But now every tribe and every language is praising God. God's going to redeem them. Something that happened in Genesis 11. Back before Abraham. Yes. Say in the Bible that so everybody in the world hears the word of God. Okay, uh, Mars. What they're talking about? Mars has a question. Yep. Well, actually, it's a different word, but in Matthew, we're just going to take a, a quick pause. 
because Mars had a question, where does it say in the Bible that every language, every people group needs to hear the gospel? That's in Matthew chapter 24. And I know this because the first Bible school that I went to where I met Shauna, this was the theme verse because they did a lot of international missions. They did big crusades and introduced people to Jesus. But just because I tell someone about Jesus doesn't mean they actually have seen the gospel. You haven't seen the gospel until you've seen somebody's life. And in Matthew 24, and Matthew 24 is about the end times, because the disciples are asking, they're like, when's all this stuff going to happen? And Jesus says, this gospel in Matthew 24, 14, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Have we done that yet? No. There's still couple thousand people groups that haven't been reached yet and so they might have coca-cola but they don't haven't heard of jesus yet that's totally possible so that's where that scripture comes from Mars. it's a good question and the word there is one of the na- one of the words we're going to go to soon it's the word ethnos which is the word for nation so it's not a political nation because in 1970s we had actually had a representative from Jesus, like either a church or somebody got saved from every political nation at that time. So everybody was thinking in the 70s, Jesus is coming back. Look, everybody's represented. No, it's the word is ethnos, so ethnicity. Jesus, we need to reach every ethnicity of Jesus. And it says that we will. Um, here it says that it's made up of every tribe, tongue, people and nation and the word people is like a people group so those who are of like the same stock and language when i think of stock and language i think of like i don't know why like ireland and welsh they would be on that's right they use the word stock that way um i think of actually what i what i really think of is in lord of the rings there's three different branches of hobbits and one, one is the stewards, and they look like this. And then there's the other kind of harbor, hobbits that look like this. And they like the water. These ones hate the water. And they would have a similar language. The same is true of people groups. We have that. And they would have the same dialect even. So not just the language. They have the same dialect. You know, people can tell we're from northern Ontario if you're from other places. Adelaide got to experience some of that. At least people know you're from Canada because of the the dialect. So that's what Jesus is saying, or these elders are saying, you have made to be a kingdom out of all these different kinds of groups, which is great. Now, there are, have been times in history where people did not like this. This is one of the reasons why um, masters did not teach their slaves about the gospel, because they didn't want to go to heaven with them. That's how does that, that, that that's, that's a blind spot, obviously, um, that they had. And I actually heard a good message about that called the Southern Blind Spot uh, yesterday when Dane and I were traveling. So all of the ways that humans are divided up, you can actually think about that. This is actually the way humans are divided up. Break up into groups of tribes and families. Our family doesn't get along with their family. Remember Deb telling me stories about that? Oh, you can't spend time with them. They're the Maxwells. It's like, well, you know, that's too bad. We're just, we are who we are. Um, People are are divided by languages. People are divided by, well, what, not only what language are you from, but what part of the country are you from? And yet God's like, no, you're all going to be united in me. And we're going back to Genesis 1. We're going back to Genesis 1. And you can actually see that uh, throughout this passage they'll reign together on earth with him and then it says in, in 11 he, john's looking again here he goes he's looking then i looked and i heard the voice of many angels around the throne the living creatures the elders and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousands and thousands of thousands saying in a loud voice worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and blessing. 
I think he's over. I, this would be hard on your ears. And I think it would be exciting. The best example now, you've probably all been in church services where they have the repetitive, or no, not repetitive, but where, where I say a word and you're going to repeat a phrase back to me. And how sometimes when that happens, um, I'm going to, I'm going to go to the verse, uh, Gabe, Gabe smiling because we talked about this the other day, our, one of our group, our men's group. And there's a Psalm that's like this. And in Psalm one, 136, I think it is. You've all heard this one or possibly have. Right. Here's the last verse. It says, Oh, give thanks to the God of gods for his mercy endures forever. In fact, every single line in this entire song ends with his mercy endures forever. Now, if I were to say it right now, go, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Your mercy endures forever. Now, I've been in churches where the response of sir is his mercy endures forever. That's not what John's hearing. Gabe, can you maybe try the example of what we we're talking about? Uh, Give thanks to the God of gods. Uh, we were just like, how about imagine saying that, you know, like when you're, you hear the guys in the army and they're like, Wait, well, well, they're, they're like, there, we were talking about how their response is more like gung ho, like, yeah. like, Give like thanks. Number of them, like, yeah. Know? Give thanks to the God of gods for his mercy and endures forever. You know, and that's what these angels are sounding like. Super, exactly. A super exciting moment in heaven. And why is he sharing this? Why would God show a vision like this to the people? Because some of them are going through difficult times. Some of them are struggling with the environment they live in. You need to, when we look, we're told to look up into heaven. We're told to, when things are difficult on earth, we look up. We stop focusing on what's around us. This is the good stuff that we're supposed to be thinking about. And this is the good stuff that's going to happen at the end. Because remember, revelation is revelation of Jesus at the end. It does. It's like a party, but it's loud and long and lots of people. And angels. That still sounds like a party. And angels, yeah. An ultimate tailgate. And it says, every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard him saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Okay, I just thought about this one a little bit because uh, it's almost like all of heaven erupts in praise. And now all the other creatures, it doesn't say that every man says every creature so what in the world does it sound like for things that live in the ocean to praise god humpback whales. whales there you go mars that's good imagine humpback whales praising god every created thing every created thing. <coughs> so why does it have to stop with animals why does it have to stop with animals that's right maybe the coral singing if you're thinking underwater the trees, the trees. rocks, rocks. Oh, yeah. Clams, yeah, they would touch it. Mars, Mars is like clams, yeah. Uh, so that's exactly it. So all these things are praising God, and John gets to understand that in a moment. That's pretty exciting. And then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the four, 24 elders fell down and worshiped them who lives forever and ever. So as we're getting ready for the end, just we haven't even opened the scrolls yet. This is just the act of, oh, we are here. This is the end coming. We are so excited because you, you're worthy. And we get to see it, what's going to happen. And we get to participate in it. I also like the fact that um, there's like an amen corner in heaven. It's those four living creatures. They all go, amen. And everybody falls down from worships. There, there is a time where every person has to bow their knee and submit to Jesus as Lord. 
Um, but that's going to come at the end. So I think for this one here, I think he's seeing creatures and he's using the word creatures on purpose because I don't know that men are included in this yet. Because there's an ultimate end. Could be wrong. So Deb's asking if there's a C in front of the throne, how far back was John standing? If it's a C of black. Yeah, we don't know. Maybe he's standing on the water. Maybe he's picturing it from above. Um, he's, he's good enough that he can recognize that there are individual thrones. He's probably amongst the thrones. So imagine, we could even imagine a go. So there's a C at the front, and then all around the back and all around is those other thrones. He could be standing amongst the thrones that are kind of there. This whole passage reminds me of Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. In Colossians 1, 18, it says, He, meaning Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will have first place in everything. And you really see this in this passage. Who gets first place in everything? God the Father gives it to the sons. And so it's, it's not a long passage. Um, and it's really, there's not a lot of, there's a lot of action, but there's not a lot of what's going on the earth yet. What we would call what people are looking for when they read the book of Revelation, they're looking for what's going to happen at the end times. But the first thing we're supposed to do seems to be, okay, you got your message. Ephesus, you got your message. Don't forget your first love. Now, pay attention to God in heaven. He's so big. He's so good. And that's, that's kind of the setup that we have. So we don't want to get caught up just in everything that happens on earth. And really from here, I say this is the top of the roller coaster. As we get to see Jesus as the preeminent, as the first. And what's going to happen from here? Well, we're going to go down and do a few loops now. So if you want to read ahead uh, and don't expect to understand everything, because I still don't understand everything. And I've been studying it more and more since before the beginning of the year. What's going to happen? Just the, the number seven is going to show up and there's going to be a lot of repetition from a slightly different angle what's happening next because now the lamb and i'm just going to read ahead it says when i saw the lamb open one of the seals that's what happens next i'm going to leave it on a cliffhanger and everyone's going to be like well i want to read it now well, go ahead and the notes have been sent or the notes are finished so i'll be sending them when the recording is finished for this and we will be you know moving on We'll just take a quick pause here to think about how important this is to the people it's written to. For the people that are living in the midst of the Roman Empire, where they're being persecuted, or they're living in a place where it's filled with idolatry. It's really important to remind ourselves that Jesus is first. Think of ourselves living in Canada with all the disunity, all the strife, everybody trying to control the country, when in heaven, there's God the Father, and there's angels around him, 24 elders, and he's perfect. And that he knows what he's doing. And that there's that slain lamb. Also, there's another thing that was mentioned there, and that is our prayers are like incense. Remember that it said that the 24 elders had little harps with them. So I'm going to guess, let's just say little harps. Let's say like little ukuleles, little guitars. Um, and they have these bowls and they're filled with incense. Incense is something that is sweet smelling. Incense is something that God likes to smell. What does he have? That incense is described as the prayers of the saints. And they're just dumping it out for God. So that he's like, yes. In other words, that makes me think God wants me to pray. Because when I'm praying to him and I'm praying the right way, it smells good. Now, I'm not per personally a fan of, you know, the insects, incense wicks, but there are some things that I know when I smell it, I go, it 
scented candles would count. Some scented candles are good. I have smelled some incense. I didn't really care for it. Yeah. Like when you submit a candle, so you smell a sweet kind of smell. That's right. Some some sort of sweet smell. Yeah. Those butt burners. Not, not, not like, not, not the citronella wicks that we use to keep the bugs away. So on that note, uh, we're going to finish up. We're like, we're early this week. Last week was late because we're just going through it section by section. And this is, as we see this next scroll open, there's going to be a lot of activity. So pay attention to what is happening and who's involved. And it's seven scrolls, although every time you read the scrolls, and we're going to see it next week, because we're covering from chapter 6 to 12 next week. There'll be six scrolls, and then there'll be a something else, which my friend Jake calls it an interlude. Before you get to the seventh scroll, he stops and talks about somebody. And then six trumpets blast, and then he stops and talks about somebody. And it's like, there's a pattern there, isn't there? Yes, there is. And that's where we're going to leave off today. So I'm just going to pray. Thank you, Lord, for the chance to be together. I thank you that you are on the throne, Heavenly Father. And Jesus, that you are there uh, as well. And when it comes to the end, Jesus, you're the only one worthy. And when the Father's ready, he's going to hand you that scroll. And it'll be done. We don't have to be over-concerned about the environment. We don't have to be concerned about... Uh, obliterating ourselves up with war. We don't have to be concerned about a uh, super bug that's going to wipe out the whole world. We don't not be concerned about a zombie apocalypse. All the things that people are afraid of. We don't have to be afraid of aliens because you've given us a picture that at the end, the Father hands Jesus the scroll and the Spirit is there the whole time. We just want to echo what those great creatures say. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, and who is, and who is to come. Amen.